Thanks everyone for coming uh, for watching Dr. Bubu show. We have uh, a guest for you today, uh, author of the book of In Between. Uh, this is uh, Mrs. Sena Jimjimo. Mrs. Sena Jimjimo, uh, first of all, you are from here, from <laughs> Chicago, the state I live in. I'm very proud of you. I'm very happy for you for your new, new book. Thank you, thank you. I'm happy to be here. Thank you for having me. Yeah, welcome to Dr. Google Show. Thank you. My question, I don't know where to, where to start and what to say because there is everything in this book. <laughs> you, you talked about many things. You talked about the history, you talked about the politics, you talked about the geopolitics of the world. Uh, many, you wrote, there's oh, a lot yeah. of things in here. But I have no idea where to start. But um, Did you enjoy and, my event? Well, the event was great, excellent. You did an outstanding. And uh, there's a couple of things I want to touch out of the event also that I really liked it. Wow. Uh, one of the things I really want to ask you is that uh, you talk about African women abuse, things of, you know, what is going on <coughs> in Africa. But yeah. for that, the perfect example is this girl called uh, Zainab, a 15-year-old girl, which is mixed between Somali and, and Oromo. And it's, it's a very sad, according to what you, what you write, but uh, can you talk about that? Absolutely. Well, Zainab and I met when I was about 14, 15. She was maybe like about 16 and 17 at the time when we met. Right. Uh, because she was born premature, she was a very petite, yeah, yeah. And, uh, short and small, very light uh, weight and um, very beautiful. Yeah. So Zainab and I met uh, in a... I guess uh, late 1990s, yeah. and uh, so we became a very good friend. And uh, she was married to a guy who was in his I'm early 30s, you, yeah, yeah. very strong, very tall, and um, and he seemed very moderate. And you, we, I, we had a lot of discussion with him about yeah. women issue, about uh, women uh, empowerment stuff like that. And he yeah. was a very good friend with me. Yeah. But uh, later on, I ended up seeing a lot of signs of abuse from Zainab, yeah. and I couldn't believe that was. Come, uh, was actually was being happening to her because of him. Yeah. He was a source of her pain. Yeah. It just it didn't go well for me because he was such a nice guy, yeah. such a humble, and he talked about woman empowerment. Yeah, yeah. And then at night, yeah. uh, when he goes home with his wife, uh, who was very young at the time, and uh, but I see a lot of abuse, a lot of uh, bruises, a lot of uh, broken uh, nose, stuff like that. I see yeah. a lot of uh, that kind. Uh, and so it really broke my heart. And another thing I forgot to say is like, that chapter is, is chapter seven and it's, uh, it's, it means a lot to me. Yeah. And I dedicate, as I say in the book, uh, most of my life and uh, wanted to kind of bring that issues that is happening inside the door, inside the bedroom, or yeah. inside everybody's house, but nobody talks about this abuse. It's not in our culture to bring abuse or stuff like that mm. to public arena. Now you also ask her uh, what is a you know because from the sign you you saw because the bruise from her face and you know her. Um, more change of mood and you're trying to ask her, she wouldn't tell you. The yeah, about yeah, it. so uh, I, I keep noticing the bruises, she wouldn't say nothing to me and one time she was, she wasn't, she went home to her parents yeah. about I don't know, seven days, five days, she came back and I came a few days later, I saw a view and then we ran into each other when she was coming from the bathroom yeah, yeah. and she ran quickly to the room and came out later on that evening, yeah. we talked and she told me, she pro made me promise that do not tell them. But he beat me and my family keep returning me, that's why I go home. And I was, I'm like, why don't you just run away? She was like, I have you know, nobody. Yeah. And uh, there's, there's a lot of stories that I know, people like Dana. What did you do at that point? When you oh, when I, yeah, so the, there are different uh, events that happen. Yeah. There are times that she really had broken, she really seemed to be wanting to run away to somewhere. Yeah. But there are other times that she really believed that he beats her because he loves her. Yeah, 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 and I did yeah. say that a little bit of that. And I'm personally conflicted. I'm just like, how could he beat you when you are such a small and he's yeah. very strong and you really believe that he beat you this hard because he loves you? Yeah. And she, she seemed to be believing that uh, idea that he beats her up because he loves her. And other times... Um, we're going to go back about the, what you write about, you know, the problem of Aroma, but we, we, I'm going to still keep you in Africa. You also talked about Liberia. 
uh, Liberia is a, is, is a country has been uh, purchased by uh, United States in early 1822 uh, to return the existing African slave to uh, Liberia. And can you talk about that? Mm, absolutely. So um, I came to learn uh, about Liberia in my undergrad and on um, political science in my major. Yeah. So uh, the moment I learned about Liberia, I was very excited because I felt like it is perfect example that I can explain about Ethiopia. Yeah. It was a, such a perfect because everybody knows they say that Liberia and Ethiopia are not colonized, but yeah. they know that Ethiopia is the only one that are not colonized. Yeah. So um, Liberia is a perfect example to me to express to other non Romans the issue that's going on in Ethiopia. Yeah. So what happened in Liberia is in um, I think it's eighteen seventeen. Yeah. The group of uh, rich white people, they really didn't know what to do with this emancipated slaves. Yes. Some of them are educated. Yeah. So if they allow them to stay in the state, yeah. they might be threat to the other slaves, they might educate them. Yeah. So empower them, they're going to revolt. Because in the South, back then, yeah. the population of a slave is four times, three to four times larger. Yeah. So it's about, for a hundred people, there's about 75 some of the people, black people. Yeah. It's about only less than 25% ratio of white people, but they are in control. So if these educated slaves are empowered and yeah. they told the educated this slave, all they have to do is upright and say yeah. we're not going to be slaves because they already have 75% of the population. Yeah. And so for that fear, they thought it was uh, best for them to purchase a place for them so yeah. they could go back and there, them back, uh, back to the vet. Yep. Uh, there are some uh, study that says like they actually the uh, purchase was requested by some slave who wanted to reconnect back to Africa because yep. they came from Africa. Yep. So there are a little bit of both. The majority of uh, the study that I saw is that uh, it actually is for the interest of the least of the uh, Caucasian Americans that wanted to send back those educated yep. free slaves to Africa so they won't be threatened to them in the state. Yeah, and 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 uh, I just okay, I want to keep you in that point. Um, you also talked about the Liberian and the Ethiopian not being colonized in Africa, but uh, I do think in the early eighteen, I mean during the second Italian invention invention to Ethiopia, uh, uh, you know Ethiopia was being the Italians was been there from nineteen thirty five to nineteen forty one. And in between this 1931 to 41, the Italians did five years, did a lot of things, build a school, bridge, hospitals, clinics, and they even, for the first time, our people, we learn with our language, the, you know, by, you know, by our way, our language. We really learn during the Italian time. But by then, in Ethiopia, there is no any sense of central government or central command because Haras Lasse was in Ethiopia, in uh, England, in Britain by then. So it, that was in 1941 is when Ernest returned. And Italians didn't leave because of the will of the Ethiopian. They really fight Italians. But, you know, there was a conflict between the colonizers, which is from Kenya, was England from part of Somalis, Italians. And also there is internal problem with the colonizers themselves. That's why they basically the Italian left, and also there is this history of the Christianity, or the, how, anyway, can, how do you see, uh, because in my view, I, the Italians definitely colonized Ethiopia for five years. Can you talk about that? Yeah, uh, I agree on, on your view on that. What was happening at that time was that there's this great powers, um, in the late um, 19th century, they, uh, after slave trade was abandoned, like they say, it should be illegal. Yeah. So they got together about things about 14 or 10 uh, superpower countries. They say yeah. that to claim Africa as their territory, they have to physically occupy it. Yeah. They say. So during that, so every Portugal, everybody kind of want to uh, uh, occupy Africa, they everybody claimed it. And yeah. East Africa, particularly, was kind of like British uh, colonizing Kenya part, some part of uh, Somalians, yeah. the, uh, the Italians taking the Eritrean, and some part of uh, the Somalians. Yeah. So before that, Ethiopia did have a business relationship with Britain, particularly because Britain is in the area. Yeah. They are very superpower, yeah. and Great Britain being you know, yeah. the most superpower at the time. So they have this relationship going on even before the direct colonization of Africa. Yes. They have a, a business trade going on. Yeah. Uh, so what happened is that when Haile Selassie exiled, yeah. 
Yeah. Of course, the uh, Italians did uh, colonize Africa. In yeah. fact, they colonized for five years, yeah. five solid years. Uh, Hans Lasse was in exile in Great Britain. Correct. All this time, of course, they built the road, they built hospital, they did a lot of things. They did a lot of good things mm -hmm. for the Romo people, and they empowered the Romo people to be able to speak their language, stuff like that. Yeah. So uh, I, do, I don't doubt for a second, I don't think anyone speed that Ethiopia was colonized by uh, Italians. But the thing is, like, how was Ethiopia able to overthrow uh, uh, such a big country? I mean, at the time, uh, Italy is a very strong country. Okay. But there is internal conflict going on. Yeah. Uh, with the, they didn't like um, the person in power. Um, I forgot his name, but they were, there was real internal conflict going on. They wanted really to push Italy away, Italy being aggressive to other countries. And the Great Britain did not want Ethiopia to be colonized. Yes. They, it's, it's in their interest to leave that country alone. And it was part of the argument that we were not going to push that. Yeah, but yeah, yeah. Italy, um, and there's very soon there's going to be a World, a World War II coming uh, right after that. So because of that uh, internal issue, so when uh, friend, uh, Italians colonized uh, Ethiopia. Yeah. Great Britain was unhappy about, so they start talking about. In the U.S., was involved a little bit in it. Yeah. They, they thought it was best for them to support them uh, through military, yeah. and they did train them, and they were able to overthrow the Italy with the support of Great Britain. Okay, and they literally brought back Harris Lassie with their power, with their everything. Yeah, to learn the history. To give a proper answer, answer for, right. the for the question, for the following question. Yeah, and then also you talk, um, you talk about the uh, Oromo identity crisis caused by during um, Abyssinian dehumanization project. You on your page against the Oromo on your page eighty nine. Can you talk about that? So identity identity crisis is uh, for those. At, I'll give you an example. Just this past year, um, I, I attended in a some kind of birthday thing and then this lady couple they walk in mm -hmm. and they they tell me some typical Amhara name. Yeah. And then I introduced myself, my name is Sana. Yeah. Oh she was like, Oh, you're a Romo. I have an Romo name. Yeah. And I I'm like and then so she gives me an Romo name. Yeah. So and I see this often. There's a lot of people yeah. that they are truly a Romo. They know, but because they want to blend in with their Ethiopian friends, yeah, yeah. they want to please them. They want to be. They want to feel welcome, so they have this either different, unique name. Yeah. So what that does is that it creates identity crisis. Who is she? Who is that girl that told me a different name that nobody else knows that yeah. she have a different Romo name, but everybody else know her by her Amhara name. Yeah. And then so it is an identity identity crisis that uh. A lot of our people, a lot of Romo people suffer that are uh, to be a Romo or to be Ethiopian. Yeah, yeah. You know what I'm saying? And no, the, I, I think one of the things is I've, um, uh, I really want to talk about this is that um, it is, I don't really mind somebody calling himself Ethiopian or any almost, that, that's to me, but uh, first of all, I'm a Romo. You know what I mean? It is, you can be Ethiopian if you want to be Ethiopian by just being proud, being a Roman. Absolutely. I, I, I'm, I'm, that's what I'm saying from the book. I have no problem you being Ethiopian, but it should not be a problem for you to be in a Roman. Yeah, but exactly. But unfortunately, I'm unfortunately as you know very well, and I know, yeah. it's too often when I introduce myself as an Oromo, yeah. and if the house is full of Ethiopians, yeah. being that you can be a Romo Ethiopian, you can be Tigray Ethiopian, you can be a Mar Ethiopian, that's fine, I have yeah. no problem, and I believe we're all yeah. equal. But the moment I identify myself as a Romo, it's a threat to them. Yeah. And exactly. all of a sudden there's a negative energy, and there's when this the name of Romo, Romo, Romo mentioned. So yeah. my thing is that, like, we need to be strong. It's like, I should be proud of Romo. That's fine. Be a Romo Ethiopian. I have no problem. You can yeah. be Ethiopian, but you are a Romo. Because yeah. Ethiopia is this big 72 tri uh, different uh, tribe or people that live in one country. Yeah. And Romo is one among those. Yeah. So, and the fact that we are the largest group, whether it's a population as far as land or resource, it should be okay to be an Romo. And it's okay for Amara to accept me as like, yep, yeah, she's a Romo Ethiopian. Yeah, you're a uh, Tigray Romo. Because nobody gave me when somebody said they're Amara. The thing is, me being a Romo, I'm, you just be happy, confident who, who you are. 
And one thing I do believe, I don't believe if anybody of any tribe or anybody is better than anybody else. If anybody is better than anybody else, or if anybody is better than to somebody or whatever, I think Oromo is better than anybody for me because it's my tribe. That's where I came from. Of course, you know because you should say? be special. Yeah, you feel special. Exactly. So the, the thing is, what they do is that they set into people's mind that being such a tribe is being smart, being a ruler, a being civilized, being uh, everything nice you ever think about human being. And that, you know, that's why most of us, you know, you know, th that is a cause of dehumanizing. Right, yeah, that's the cause of, it's been, it has been happening for so long that we, Oromos, have accepted their superiority that we want to be them rather yeah. than us. You know what I'm saying? That yeah. is what I'm talking about. Like, yeah. we have um, infatuated with their dance and their language. It is cool to be them, but it's not so cool to be us. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. So my thing is that I'm fine, it's cool, be you, and let me be cool and be, and I think it should be okay. We are all the different, and we yeah. should embrace that, our differences, yeah. and I should be proud to be who I want to be. Yeah. And they should be proud to be who they want to be. Yeah. But for too long in a Romo society, I have seen a lot of Romo people that they are infatuated with this um, Ethiopian uh, notion of the Amaranization. Yeah. You know, as long as you speak that language, you are from that city area, then yeah. you're cool. Other than that, if you are you know, from the other part, from the south or countryside, you're not so cool, you're not too smart. Yeah, Everything yeah, you do yeah, is yeah. like, you feel uncomfortable. Yeah, but you yeah. should, that should not be the case. Yeah, and yeah. a person, human being, should be respected to the for the identity for who they who are, they are the rather than uh, trying to assimilate or something else. Yeah, that's why I try really uh, give you credit for that clip you are trying to create that you are trying to show during oh, but, the book signing yeah, ceremony. Yep. Yeah, so what I wanted to do with the kids is I want the parents to see that because there's a lot of videos that you haven't seen. There's on one of that interview, one kids he hates his hormone. And the interview we didn't show, we don't want to protect, we want to protect his identity. Yes. yes. He's a high school freshman. Yeah. He say he hates his hormone. And we asked him, why? He was like, when I tell people um, this, they were like, oh, what kind of name is that? He want to be John. He want to be Smith. Yeah, that means the he, dehumanization of Oromo and the Oromoma is still, the project is still going on yeah, here in, in, the, in the United States. States. So it's that is it's very case. important. I, I picked up on that point. It's very important us to educate our kids, empower them who they are, and empower the culture, their identity, who they are as a Roma. It's very important. That's yeah. why I focus because the dehumanization, that's a perfect example yeah. that what is going Have on. Have embedded the has passed to our kids. And on top of that, what I want to add is like, the only difference between me as a Roma and Amara or African American is our culture and language. Correct. The moment you forget that, you are just another black person. And I have no problem being a black person. Right. That what makes me unique as a Nuromo is the fact that I have my name, yes. my, I speak my language, yeah. in the culture I practice. The yeah. moment you left that out, I am just another black. Well, uh, you talked about the abuse, anything about, bad about, uh, women abusing in Africa or in Romania or elsewhere in Africa, but there's also a, a beautiful part of our culture, uh, which is whether it's Sera, you know, whether it's Sera Sike, Sera Challe, and uh, also Sera Irefana, where nobody can go to Malka without a woman. And what about this beautiful part of our culture also? And I didn't read my. Can you talk and about that? It, um, actually, yes, it's very true that um, I, I personally choose to focus in this part. There's a lot of beautiful that Oromoada that we have that respects and puts women first. I do that. I do know that. Mm -hmm. I do know that very well too. But at the same time, I feel like um, me being Africa, born and raised in Africa, myself personally, mm -hmm. and myself witnesses uh, witnessing abuses of of many many people that near and dear to my heart, yeah. my friends, you know, families and um, things that I have seen. But too often, none of those stories makes to book or newspaper 
or even to the top of the town. Yeah. That is the thing that I want to bring out. Yeah. Is uh, I know we want to create this uh, illusion that we are such a beautiful, perfect culture that Oromo women are they we cannot fulfill uh, Malka unless a woman is present, or we cannot cross in front of a woman that's passing by. Even if you're going to a wedding, it's true. All of that is a very fact. You know, you can't uh, cut the, unless a woman. That's yeah, I wish I could that. hear that much about it. The reason why I'm saying is that when you are going to, let me give you an example. Uh, we have Rachel uh, ceremony. Uh, ceremony every year. We were where more than four million people attended. And there is no any single man go to Malka for a recha without a woman present or without a woman with a CK present. That much privilege women have into our society. And, and you know, all whether it's a, as I just said, whether it's a challe, whether it's a challe, whether it's a CK, whether it's, you know, I mean, there is there is a beauty part of where women or women really have a a right than even than no, a man. No. I mean, I didn't hear that one. I, 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 I know that where you coming from saying that uh, I did not hear that. And that's a beautiful uh, part of Oromo culture that really excites me. Yeah. But personally, as I said earlier, that yeah. I don't know if you want to ask me a particular question, but right, right. there is, in not just Oromo, yeah, yeah, this yeah. is actually the discussion that I have with at least 15, 16 non Oromo friends that I have. Whether yeah. it's from Guinea, yeah. Eritrea, Somalia, yeah. or we can go to Nigeria and Ghana. Which I, yeah. I've been to Gambia myself, yeah. where there's a mutilation, gender mutilation, still happening to women. Yeah. I've been to many African, uh, other African countries. I've seen a lot of uh, abused women in America that are African descent. They are not just from Oromo, yeah. but it's too often their stories. Our stories are similar, yeah. and they're never being discussed where they should be discussed. Because I feel like, as Africans, we want to uh, show ourselves as being holy, as being having a good, strong culture. Yeah. And I just feel like uh, too, many, too many times, women voices left in the gutter. And only uh, the men voices are carried on for too long. And uh, you know, as much most people like your book, some people don't like it too. Because, because of that people think itself. that... You know, we in Aroma, we are very conservative, where women and men are very collaborative and no, it's not like much of abusing like here in West Africa or elsewhere. And and you kind of, uh, you know, break into it and, you know, train, uh, you know, she kind of, uh, Sena kind of came into this culture where we have no really, Oromo really, we don't have much of women abuse really like any other <laughs> West African <laughs> Uh, you know, West African country. So, uh, so what I what I'm yet what I want to say is that some conservative societies, conservative Oromo, really didn't like because they think you are making strike. You know, the yes, women ma'am. against their husbands. Uh, right. So, can you talk about that? <clears throat> Absolutely, that is not my intention. Um, because I do believe in a, a marriage union, and I believe both men and women need each other. All right. And uh, women need a uh, man support, love, and caring just as much as men need to. Yeah. And uh, you're not the first one asked me this question because before even the book came out, mm -hmm. I have a few reviewers that particularly wrote a book review based on their disagree with me, saying that I'm bringing such a negative thing from that. Per but I'm saying it's like at least you, everything has to balance. You have to talk mm -hmm. the negative and the positive. Yeah. The love, excitement, uh, exciting thing have been written about Sinke in the final Romo as well as English. I've read it, some of it, yeah. and I'm pretty sure there are many that have not read it. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, Avara, unless we talk these things out in public, mm -hmm. unless we sh we should be a, we should have a platform where it's okay for women if she's been abused to come and talk about it. That's I give you for example in Chicago, my uh, in my own city, I know about four women personally, yeah. that are being abused by their husband. Some of them are going to mental institution. Mm -hmm. Some of them are going to group therapy class. Mm -hmm. The person who told me, they didn't know I knew them personally, so they just pointed like, oh, me and her attended in this group, she's African American, they attended together, this group together. Mm -hmm. And it's just too many times that I feel like 
I want to help those women. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They should not be going to the suffering in America where there's so much resource. Yeah. Rather, we should teach our brother that, you know what, it's yeah. not it's okay for her to abuse her, to beat her up, to uh, yeah. harass her in any other way that yeah. the more that she should. No, what, what but I'm I saying, think we should do that rather than just talking about the fantasy of perfection. Yeah. We are Romans. Yeah, yeah. We like to think as we are not like the West African people. But truly, there's much to talk about Oromo too. I'm hoping to talk about in the future. Yeah, I mean, there is a, we have not that much of a, for example, uh, according to even our marriage culture, you know, whether you family want you to marry maybe a man that you have never seen in your lifetime. But I, I like the fact that the relation they get married each other, the relation lasts longer, they love each other, they create. I mean, my, I can give you a good example. My father didn't know my, my mom when the, they married each other. It is proposed by their parents. And the relationship went fine, very good. And they love each other today. Until today, they're living together. You know what I'm trying to say? So my, my whole, the point I want to make is that we don't have that much of really typical, like any other Afro African American or even Westerns, or, you know, the women abuse. We, we, we don't, I do believe, we don't really, I don't necessarily say there is no women abuse, abuse in, our, in our society, but... It is not like border cross this type of abuse that is really known in, in Romania because you know there is women as normally have got much more respect into our culture. So that's what I'm trying to do. Uh, I know for sure I'm going to be for my interview from previously. I have been hammered yeah. as such a man hater, as a feminist, as such a uh, thou child break a family. Yeah. I definitely want to emphasize that that is not my goal, yeah. and I don't. I really don't hope. That. I want to. I'm, I'm. I love men. And I'm. I'm interested in men and um, stuff like that. However, what you brought up about your mom and dad, and about my mom and dad, and almost all of our parents yeah. are already yeah. married. Yes. Most of them is a very of them that are divorced. Yeah. That is exactly the same thing in America as it used to be. Used to yeah. be arranged right. in marriage. You used to stay there. Yeah. Now, even in Ethiopia, divorce is so high. You tell me that why is there's a divorce so high in Ethiopia, if arranged marriage or uh, some kind of other kind of marriage, or is it even if it's the marriage? Well, that's I think it's you know, because there is a fifty-one percent of divorce in America. Here we are living. In. Exactly. What I'm we don't really have fifty percent of divorce. No, but we are coming very close. I look, we look at our standard of living. Yeah. You can't compare yourself with America. If America is at eighty percent of divorce rate, yeah. ours should be at the twenty percent because our economy, our education, we are still under ten percent of education. Eighty nine percent of our population is still uneducated. Yeah. You know, we live in poverty, so you can't compare. But my point is this: yeah. about life. what worked in the past mm. would not work because women are educated, yeah. women are empowered. They have become independent. We have to embrace that. Yeah. I think it is a plus support when you have a wife that can contribute for you. For right. God forbid, if you get sick or you die, who's going to take care of your children? Your women have to be ready to take that role. Our sister, our kids have to be ready to step up when she's needed. Because yeah. back in the day, it was all our father who yeah. brings the money, yeah. who takes care of everything. But those days have gone. Yeah. So we need to prepare our women for the challenge, for, for the challenge at the time. Yeah. And that's... And other part also you talked about your uh, foundation, Dembodu. Uh, when do you, you know, do you create this foundation? Do you found this foundation? Um, what, um, do you, what do you, what do you did since you created and what did you got? Okay. Uh, thank you for asking me this uh, particular question, Avala. And yeah. this is a, a foundation I dedicated my life to and I was lucky, uh, opportunity came for me to step up, take that role. So the year was 2007, I believe, or two, December 2006, 2007. I went to Oromia to visit on my way from village, my dad's village, to the city. Yeah. I got stopped by a uh, school principal. Mm -hmm. I didn't know he was school principal, but you know, they told me later on, it's still coming in. I'm like, no, I can't come in because I don't have the money to give. He was like, no, I don't need your money, just come in, I just wanted you to come and see the school. I really didn't want to go in because, you know, I know they needed money. 
Yeah. And I don't have any money to give. Yeah. So I'm sister, and I was with my cousin. Finally, they were just come in. So I'm like, I'm going in. All I'm thinking is like, man, they're going to buy soda. I have to pay for that. I have to pay for this. Mm -hmm. So there was about five people. They bought soda. They bought bread. I'm like, and coffee. I'm like, okay, how much that soda cost? I'm like that. So I'm just really calculating how much I have to pay. Because I feel like greedy. that. <laughs> 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 but I feel I have to pay at least that money. I'm just <laughs> so... Anyway, we after our little talk of how the school started, how many times the school got burned, right. how, how it got burned by each Ethiopian government, and then the school got rebuilt. They started under a tree with the Thai people. Right. It's a very interesting story. The book's gonna come out hopefully, coming hopefully in the next few years, right. if not next year. That uh, it's just fascinating to hear, and I was so excited. And they gave me a school tour. And it's a primary school, they, they go, it goes up to 8th grade, which is uh, middle school too. Yeah. The sad thing is, some of the class, most of the class actually, is half open on top, the roof is open. Yeah. The water pours in in the winter time, yeah. and half of the board is wet. And the kids go to school there, and they say almost 70 to 80 percent kids, they get sick with the cold and symptom flu every year. Yeah, yeah, because so, of So, yeah, yeah, because of the condition smells yeah, really yeah, bad. Yeah. And I just saw that and I just, it broke my heart. And so after that, I ate, I didn't really promise anything. I came uh, back to the state and it really touched my heart and changed me forever. It was about a couple hundred dollars, so about a thousand dollars in my hand at the time. So I convinced that everyone yeah. should contribute that money. Yeah. We contribute that money. The net the following year, they were also able to fundraise from the US uh, US ID or US Aid. Yeah. They got about I believe it's a fifty thousand Ethiopian per. Yeah. And I was able to give them I don't know a thousand or more, and then they, to put that together, they were able to cover the roof part mm -hmm. and they built two classroom there with the concrete ground. Okay. So I uh, fast forward and two thousand. Um, in 14, beginning of the end of 2013, 14, I went back. This time I went ready. I went with the two mission in mind. I wanted to invest uh, a continuous relationship with the school where I'll be able to help yeah. with the school and also help particularly the girls. And it's not because I'm choosing the girls, but because almost half of the girls that go to that school, or yeah. schools like the Bucharaya, they drop out of school before they even transfer to high school. Yeah. Less than even one third of those graduate from high school and go to attend college. Yeah. And among those, maybe one to five percent that go to college, less than one person get a job or live a normal life. What's your dream? What do you want to do? So what I want to do is, I what my foundation, Dumbo Group, yeah. does is, I want to make sure every person, every girl, at least graduate from high school. Okay. Other part of my foundation is I want to invest in um, entrepreneurship yeah. because there's not enough work market for yeah. this girl to be employed by the government yeah. or by a uh, private sector. I want them to have their own business. I yeah. want to uh, invest in a, that mentality that, you know what, even if it's sewing or uh, crafting or something like that, if she a uh, thought my, what I want, what the Bombo does is right now, we provide the material. Yeah. So those girls who are in top class, yeah. their school uniform stuff like that will be covered. I've been doing that for uh, last year and I did this for you, this year, so Good. for two years. The other part of my foundation is we're going to have a, a club of 15 to 20 girls, yeah. hopefully more. We provide the material for sewing, for crafting, for everything. Yeah. Uh, we'll provide the funding to school, the school buys that. Yeah. These girls are trained how to sew, and everything they finish, they sell in the market. 50% yeah. goes to their pocket, and 50% goes to the school, and we do reverse the So at least when they graduate, or maybe in case they went out of the, the school, 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 they, they have, have some skills, skills that will be sustained yourself. All right, um, thank you for coming on Dr. Google Show, and I hope to have you again, and thank you again. Thank you. Um, thank you for having me. Thank you for listening. And uh, I really uh, appreciate for giving me this platform uh, to talk about a foundation, especially that means a lot to me. And I hope, uh, and I also believe that I do, I'm too, I'm too not uh, financially stable to make a difference in all Romania around the world. 
I want to inspire somebody from their village mm -hmm. to do the same thing for their own city, for their own village. Yes. I want the book to be around the world. I want the book to all over the world so we can educate every person. Yeah. Thank you for giving me to say that to people that knows that. And hopefully one of my girls will watch it. Is, right. you know? yeah, yeah. So I really do appreciate it. Thank you for giving me this chance. Thanks for coming. Thank yeah. you. Good luck to you. Thank you. Good luck with your foundation. Ah, thank you. All right. <laughs>